Hello everyone, my name is Pat Sacker and I am the Editorial Director for the Middle East and Africa at the Economist Intelligence Unit. I am res responsible for establishing clear vision of objectives, activities and services for both the regions to add value for different stakeholders and our clients, while at the same time managing a large internal pool of analysts who are working from across the globe from South Africa, Dubai, London, and Asia. I have got a number of years of experience covering both the regions, ensuring that our services, whether it's subscriptions or in briefings and client briefings, are one of the most insightful available in the market. As we come close to the end of year two, 2020 of the pandemic, and enter year three of recovery with caution in 2022 across the world. Today's presentation will focus on firstly, impact of COVID on the Middle East and North Africa. Secondly, recovery as we move into 2022. Thirdly, evolving relationships with the UAE, between South Korea and UAE. Fourthly, emerging business opportunities within the Gulf Corporation, GCC states. And finally, summary points and some of the key takeaways for the areas that we cover today in front of 2022 and beyond 2022, right up to 2026. So what is in store? for the MENA region as we move into 2022. As you can see here, the heat map highlights the changing stringency of government health and containment responses across MENA region with GCC states showing being underscored. They did pretty well. Government response was swift, particularly the GCC. They were very fast at the beginning of the pandemic and most stringent early in the pandemic, very critical during the high, heights of the first wave from April to June 2022. Governments clearly reacted quickly to contain the spread of the virus, given experience of previous viral outbreaks such as SARS. Also, the impact of rising infection rates and severe lockdowns for prolonged periods started to bite across the economies. Firstly, in the form of uh, curfews, travel restrictions, including on international flights, internal and cross-border transport, and increased testing. Very, very quick off the mark there. Secondly, infection rates. Middle East was hit, particularly the GCC, pretty hard early in the pandemic per 100,000 population uh, in some of the GCC states, but they have eased rapidly since then while death rates per capita are very low by international standards, especially in GCC. GCC straight states have flattened the infection curve, but sanitary situation appears more fragile elsewhere in the region, as you can see from the heat map. There's no doubt that the GCC states are weathering the pandemic the best. These countries have well-funded healthcare systems, authoritarian rule, and ample cash reserves, deep financial pockets. Looking at the Middle East, as you can see from the chart, uh, economic slump, then green shoots of recovery. The chart clearly shows real GDP growth across MENA region in 2019 and 2020, highlighting a near region-wide recession last year. Exceptions were Iran and Egypt. Pandemic, COVID-19, and the decline in global oil demand prices were a real blow for the region, almost a double whammy. What you saw was a double whammy taking place. There's no question about it. And the heat map also highlights the ongoing recovery in 2021 brought about by various factors and despite the lingering presence of COVID-19. Also a resurgence in global oil markets, uh, which were supported by the region's oil exporters, the key exporters, 
especially the GCC, implemented enormous economic support and stimulus packages. Very quick off the mark in terms of policy reaction as well. What you saw was very quick action. For instance, in UAE, $9 billion were as part of the COVID-related spending in various fiscal measures, taxes, fee deferrals, increased utility subsidies, etc. Almost also 70 billion in monetary support, mainly to increase banking sector liquidity and lending. Also in Saudi Arabia, another powerhouse, $18.7 billion of private sector fiscal support package, including tax and fee delays and deferrals, and almost $13.3 billion spent on private sector monetary support package, mainly to support SMEs and access to funding. So there's no question about it. Containment measures were eased and trade flows resumed, with some teething problems caused by capacity constraints like factory and logistics bottlenecks, and additional clearance processes. Also troubled and conflict zones, uh, conflict countries, states of Yemen, Syria, Iraq, and Lebanon remain in a very fragile state characterized by weak or no economic growth and increasing risk of social unrest. As you can see from the heat map, the GCC were the best place to recover quite quickly, but nevertheless, still not out of the woods. So what does it mean in terms of corporate earning? It clearly had a immediate impact. And looking closely at how the GCC corporate sector performed, cash flow and balance sheets clearly took a major and for some sectors, unprecedented hit in 2020. Aggregated financial data for GCC listed companies revealed that net income which is corporate earnings after you extract all expenses and costs, fell from $150 billion in 2019 to very much a five-year low of just over $91 billion in 2020. And as I said, corporate earnings were particularly hard hit during the second quarter of the year against the height of the first wave of the pandemic. All sectors, with the exception of the food and beverages, telecoms and utilities, all the sectors took a dive. However, a recovery net income got underway in late 2020 and early 21, as the initial effects of the pandemic were weathered. Also, contentment measures, severe lockdowns were eased and energy prices naturally spiked. Net income in almost all sectors, especially energy firms, increased and approached new record highs towards the end of 2021. So after a major dip in 2020, in the first half of 2021, they started to recover in the second half of the year. Listed companies, for instance, in the GCC region saw their financial earnings hit a record high of 55.5 billion during the third quarter of this year, 2021, more than a double on a year-on-year -year basis and 23% on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis. Big numbers. Higher profitability reflected accelerated economic activity in the region with the PMI figures of a Saudi and UAE consistently and comfortably about the growth mark of 50 at 57.7, and 55.7 during October of this year, respectively. Energy, minerals, banking, transportation posted the strongest gains, so the recovery was fast in all the key areas. The bulk of the economic sectors were back at pre-pandemic capacities during quarter four of this year, barring a few that include tourism and hospitality for obvious reasons. Moving on, what does it mean for the trade sector? Very much a roller coaster ride for trade and dented public finances. On the trade front, uh, merchandise trade slumped across the GCC in 2020, hydrocarbon losses disrupted regional global value supply chains, which we're still undergoing. The biggest hit was in the UAE, down almost 70 billion. 
and Saudi Arabia down over 100 billion. Nevertheless, against the backdrop of what I've just said for the first half this year and vaccination rollout, rapid turnaround as global market demand picked up and logistic issues ended in 2021, more or less, helping current account pressures, particularly for countries to ease up. Some essential investment projects were fast-tracked to, to support the recovery, particularly some of the big ticket infrastructure projects in both Saudi Arabia and UAE starting to take off again. Projects which are put on hold, but not completely dismissed or eliminated were back on the table to make the move. So what does this all lead to? There's no question about it. On the pandemic front, um, GCC has been leading the race to in inoculate the population. Heat map shows a high level of COVID-19 vaccination rates per capita in parts of MENA, especially the GCC states, Israel, Morocco, um, but low rates in poorer countries. The wealthy GCC has leveraged its wealth, international relations, geostrategic importance to secure vaccine doses from major suppliers in the US, Europe, China, and Russia. Meanwhile, Morocco, Algeria, and Egypt have fully operational vaccine production facility, mostly fill and finish rather than drug manufacturing under license. This is a major medical logistics in UAE. The COVID-19 has largely remained under control during the second half of 2021. Due to declining cases, a fast-paced vaccination effort in the GCC concerns remain about the new variants. We're all experiencing the new variant Omicron as it makes its way across the world. But still very early days, but clearly it doesn't seem to be as deadly as the Delta, but highly infectious, so time will tell. Very important, vaccine diplomacy or the use of vaccine supplies as a tool of soft power projection has clearly entered the political landscape of MENA. Against the vaccine rollout in the MENA region, you need to take on board three trends can be observed. One, international vaccine diplomacy by Russia, China, and the UAE, and lesser extent US. Secondly, regional vaccine diplomacy by the UAE, Morocco, Turkey, Egypt, and Israel. Thirdly, countries that are severely challenged in launching successful vaccination campaigns for lack of state capacity, financial withdrawal, and political stability, very much the hotspots, the political conflict zones like Syria, Yemen, Libya, Sudan, and possibly Iraq are affected by this. So what's in store for the GCC for the coming year? Looking at the chart, it's clear. The GCC is heading into a pandemic recovery. Growth rates are considered to be modest, lingering effects of the pandemic, but sustainable most states posting growth above 3% on average from 2022 to 2026. Economic policy will remain supportive, especially for individuals, although efforts will be made to bring in some emergency packages if needed. For instance, if this current various uh, Omicron proves to be more deadly, certainly the governments will be very quick to put in place packages and extension of COVID-related fiscal support if needed for a temporary period. Soft restrictions, wearing of masks, social distancing, all of that will be part of the package and ensuring that the general activity overall continues. You are not going to see, again, the severe lockdowns that everybody experienced in 2020. 
So where is this heading for the global recovery in terms of where we're going? EIU forecasts that economic recovery, which started this year on the back of the wider inoculation of the vaccine, lifting off the lockdowns and with some of the restrictions, opening up the economies and the sectors will continue very cautiously into next year, with global GDP expected to forecast to expand by 4% after rebounding by an estimated 5.4% this year. The sharp rebound this year with global GDP returning to its pre-pandemic level in late 2021 really does mask great variations in the pace of recovery across the regions. The 5.4% is very healthy, but bear in mind it's coming from a very low negative indicator from last year. So against this backdrop, a sustained rise in inflation driven by rising commodity prices and supply chain disruptions will present the main risks to the global recovery. Also uh, on the back of this risk is the recent rise in global energy prices, which we expect to remain elevated at least throughout the Northern Hemisphere winter for 2021 and 2022. Major central banks will start tightening monetary policy in 2022 to curb inflation, will do, but will do so slowly for fear of derailing the economic recovery. Very cautiously, with one eye on how things are mapping out. Sharp rebound in global growth and world trade will clearly benefit GCC export sectors, energy, non-energy, as well as re-exports. For instance, GCC re-exports will ride the wave but remain vulnerable to ripples across the global economy, a very important market. Services, especially tourism, could lag behind and take longer to recover. There's no question, GCC states are proactive and high hopes of a rebound. Moving on to how what this all means for the energy market. As you can see from the map, energy prices were at some of the highest this year. In the next year, heading into next year, we expect energy prices to stabilize, edging up still, but nevertheless, not expected to be hit as high as they were this year. 2023, the price of oil will regularly be below $70 a barrel as the market returns to a steady surplus and demand growth begins to slow after the immediate aftermath of 2020. Also, rising output and elevated prices will greatly benefit GCC states through increased export earnings and fiscal revenues. Expected oil prices are also above fiscal break-even prices in all GCC states except Bahrain, according to our recent estimates. For instance, um, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Iman, and UAE break even prices in the region of 60 to 70 dollars a barrel. Qatar is below 50 dollars a barrel, and Bahrain above 85 dollars a barrel. Very comfortable positions, rebuilding their oil fiscal revenues and also sovereign wealth funds, which they have been drawing on during this pandemic two years. Moving on to the economic policy, a very important element, very central to how things are mapping out across the GCC, particularly for the corporate sector as well. Like I said, emergency economic fiscal and monetary support will be gradually withdrawn across the GCC, although improving public finances, largely on the back of hydrocarbon revenue, will allow a steady withdrawal and maintenance of some support, as well as pursuit of development projects. The government cannot take its foot off the accelerator completely. Also, very much on the back of that, for instance, in late September uh, 2021 this year, the U.S. Central Bank governor announced that its targeted economic support scheme meant to provide liquidity to the banking sector would be withdrawn gradually very much keeping an eye on how the global headwinds are moving. 
Despite the withdrawal of the liquidity when it had takes place, there is ample capital buffers, which were expected to keep the commercial banking sector sound. Also, fiscal reforms could see tax rates rises, VAT, corporate tax, custom excise, to help generate new, larger income streams. This is a key thing with, as part of Vision 2030 for the two big economies, UAE and Saudi. As part of that, a central feature of that, Vision 2030 is diversification, diversification, and diversification. So this also includes, as part of diversification, non-oil taxes. Saudi Arabia, UAE, Bahrain, and Oman already charge VAT at 5%, but Qatar and Kuwait do not. Their implementation dates are still very much unclear. VAT could rise to around 10% in the years ahead. It is not going to be backtracked. If anything, it'll be moving forward. Ongoing support package was also target vulnerable strategic sectors, particularly the travel, tourism, and hospitality, and they'll continue to support micro, small, and medium enterprises. Net effects of all of this should see Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and UAE in the black in 2021-2024, but Kuwait, Oman, and Bahrain will remain in the red. Good news for the very much the larger economies. Mixed bag there. Moving on to where debt is, they've been rising rapidly, particularly as the financial monetary support and extension of COVID-related measures were rolled out very rapidly in 2020 and into 2021, creating a financial hole that needed filling. So total international debt issuance across the GCC, as you can see from the chart, it's very much going in the high direction. Look, it's almost like a COVID chart at the beginning of the pandemic last year. So across the GCC, the debt issuance surpassed 42 billion this year in 2020, which is very much dominated by UAE, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar. Accumulated debt would edge higher, but at a slower pace as fiscal balances improve and surpasses almost a trillion dollar collectively this year. This is a very healthy return. External debt stocks and debt servicing are sustainable for the time being, given investor appetite and enormous financial buffers. Borrowing costs will remain reasonably low, but move higher in the years ahead. And when I mean by financial buffers, sovereign wealth fund, Saudi Arabia is sitting on enormous sovereign wealth fund. So is UAE. Qatar to a less extent because it's been hit hard by the boycott in recent years and also low oil prices. So what does it mean for the currencies? Moving on to the currencies, very important. What's in store for the currencies? GCC currency pegs to the US dollar. We do not expect that to change or remain in place during the outlook period of 2022-26 in the medium term. These pegs, what has it done is provided stability for decades. And despite the lack of monetary flexibility that they afford, the authorities are pretty adamant to stick to it for the time being and seem committed to them. There is very little reason for them not to. From time to time, there will be speculation about is it going to de peg? The maintenance of the US dollar peg will continue to nevertheless pose a challenge for non oil export com competitiveness and hence the diversification efforts that both Saudi Arabia and UAE are on a drive for, especially as the US dollar is expected to strengthen against the other major currencies during 2022 and 2023. However, and this is a big however, the real effective exchange rate, GCC to the dollar and GCC against other major trading currencies will weaken slightly on average reducing pressure for foreign exchange adjustment. There's no question 
confidence in the PEC's durability is supported by GCC commitment and large pool of foreign assets available to them to protect them if required. So maintaining currency pegs to the US dollar also means that the GCC central banks will continue to track the policy of the Federal Reserve, the Fed US central bank, which is expected to start to raise interest rates in the second half of 2022. And this is likely to be kicked back forward a little bit into the early part of next year, uh, if needed. Two changes of 25 basis point and slightly more is expected in 2023. So what does it mean for investors as we move into that? There's no question that pick up the pandemic, energy crisis took a heavy toll on investment and projects. And most of them are now gently coming back, out, back on the table. A number of MOUs, a number of big ticket projects have been commissioned. Public and increasingly private domestic and foreign investment will play a crucial role, will continue to play a crucial role in driving the immediate recovery and longer term development plans across the GCC. Public investment will seek to send to build core infrastructure and services as part of the economic diversification plans. Meanwhile, private sector investment will be attracted to existing giants, energy and related industry, and very important, new growth engines. There's no question, UAE is working hard to attract investment to strategic growth sectors that include hydrocarbons, plastics, chemicals, renewables, solar, wind, hydrogen, and nuclear energy. Circular carbon economy solutions are very much back on the cards. Advanced transport and logistic infrastructure and services. We've seen a rise in real estate construction as well, residential and commercial, telecoms, digital industries, advanced manufacturing, healthcare, pharmaceutical, biotech, agriculture and food supply. The list is long. So all the key areas and more is taking off in the coming years. All good news for both the public and the private sectors. There'll be a major push to promote the private sector in the coming years as part of Vision 2030 and driving a moving away from just the public sector. The bar chart highlights the expected improvement in all GCC business environments during the medium term. And the biggest advantage that UAE holds over the others. It's clearly is the key business hub for the region, not just the GCC, and also for the other markets. Promoting private sector investment, business activity, and job creation, particularly for the youth, rising a greater proportion of the population of the youth, are major elements of national development plans across the GCC. Like I said, Saudi Vision 2030, Abu Dhabi Economic Vision 2030, Dubai Strategic Plan 2030, and a very similar picture unfolding in terms of policy in Qatar and other areas. Efforts to boost the private sector has been accelerated by the need, well, firstly, the economic effects of COVID-19 pandemic, and mostly also the slump in energy markets in recent years. The spider chart highlights differences between the UAE and Saudi Arabia. Both are competing for regional economic business dominance, very much seeking to become the region's leading business and logistics hubs, trade and investment centers. And as I've already said, Abu Dhabi, Dubai is already a major business hub. But nevertheless, competition is picking up from Saudi Arabia, including also Abu Dhabi, Qatar, and other areas. For instance, in KSA, Saudi Arabia's initiatives include Project HQ, Made in Saudi, Sharq 
investment program, PPP framework, privatization programs, and very much pillars of Vision 2030. Privatization programs, including domestic investment, FDI, JVs, and PPPs, are an important element of future development plans with a focus on strategic growth sectors. Saudi Arabia is hoping to raise $55 billion through its privatization program right up to 2025. And this is where it expects the private sector to account for almost 65% of the GDP by 2030, which is currently around 50% of the GDP. UAE, further ahead of the game, and has strong PPP, public-private relations, and has a very dynamic private sector with national and foreign players. It started its diversification, dynamic business sector decades ago. The government will re-energize its privatization program focused on non-strategic industry, heavy industry and factories. There's no question that oil and gas will be, still be part of that picture, but power, water, and some banks are considered strategic with little prospect for privatization, but opportunities for contractors, suppliers, and PPS are on the cards. So acceleration of FDI, foreign direct investment. And you can see that from the chart here, the how it is expected to rise in the coming years. Global FDI flows plunged by almost 35% in 2020, largely due to disruption, uncertainty caused by the emergence of COVID-19, the whole more or less shut down at the same time and for a prolonged period of time with great degree of uncertainty. The fall was heavily skewed towards developed economies, but affected almost every region in the world. Lockdowns caused by COVID-19 around the world slowed down existing investment projects and also the prospects of a recession led multinational enterprises to reassess new projects. It almost shut down overnight and that it had a major impact, almost like a domino effect with FDI across the world. FDI inflows to the GCC bucked the downbeat of the global trend and increased to only 28 billion in 2020, net of Qatar divestment, representing an increase of 12.5%. As you can see that from the chart on the left-hand side. This reflected both ongoing policies designed to enlist foreign investment to help diversify all dependent economies and acceleration of their implementation during 2020. Out of the batch, the UAE still remained by far the preferred destination, attracting almost 71.7%, which is $19.9 billion of inward investment. It was up by 11.2% year on year and exceeding outflows of 18.9 billion for the first time since 2013. More than half was accounted for by the state entities. So you can see where the things have been going. Going forward, the upward regional trend is expected to continue in 2021 and beyond. As new laws are passed last year, notably the UAE's FDI decree, which is permitting 100% foreign ownership of onshore company. This is a game changer. And also Saudi Arabia across the country, private sector participation law is set out a clear framework for privatization as PPPs bed in and as global investment starts to pick up. You can see both the countries are moving rapidly to establish the necessary framework to benefit from this uptick of global FDI. Buy-in from international investors attracted to GCC market uh, clearly create enormous and lucrative contracts. So keep a close eye on how privatization programs are unfolding in both the countries, the biggest um, engines of growth for the GCC. Moving on, as you can see from this map, that you cannot 
completely ignore politics. Geopolitical risk in the GCC and surrounding areas is never far off. Tensions will persist across the GCC in various forms it will unfold. The effectiveness of the GCC as a regional body will be limited, with members balancing collective goals with individual strategic priorities. And we've seen that in recent years with the Arab boycott of Qatar, which was driven very much by Saudi Arabia. This will bring a complicated mix of formal and back-channel dialogue, pushing and pulling policy in different directions and making some collective responses, or responses and actions difficult to cement. Major disruptive factors include, one, uh, I would say increasingly intense commercial rivalry that is rising rapidly between UAE and Saudi Arabia, as both of them are striving to secure economic leadership and dominant business hub status. Secondly, disagreements within the core OPEC and OPEC plus members over oil production quotas and price setting strategies. We saw a window of that last year at the peak of the pandemic between Saudi Arabia and Russia. Temporary fallout, nothing major. Differences of opinion over the type and rimming of normalization of relations with Israel, the Abraham Accord, and dealings with Turkey, especially between Saudi and the UAE. Also lingering friction with Qatar following the prolonged Gulf crisis and end of the blockade in January of this year. Also response to smaller US military footprint and the rising status of China, Russia across MENA bringing intense global geopolitics into play. Who to align with and how. US-China tensions, which have been building up in recent years, where there is trade tariffs, sanctions, financial factors, political influence is likely to get even bigger. How it will affect the GCC, time will tell. But what is clear is GCC may move closer to a more unified approach for regional tensions and regional conflicts. And certainly in terms of some of the conflict hotspots like Yemen and um, Syria and Lebanon. So security concerns and will build alliances. And this is especially the case in UAE. Recently behind these doors, Negotiations, security, joint efforts are ongoing, both between the UAE, which is a, now a recognized diplomatic normal relationships, and similar picture unfolding also with Saudi Arabia. So what is the potential for an Arab Spring 3 in the region in 2020-23? Driven by social grievances linked to economic, political, marginalization, oppression and corruption, unemployment and rising living costs, plus basic food, fuel, utility shortages. Also on top of that list is poor governance and insecurity, but unlikely to take place directly affect the wealthier GCC. Periodically, you are going to see social instability rising in certain parts of the region, particularly in North Africa, but certainly in places like Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, it's, it's a catastrophe unfolding there over the years. Okay, moving on to how what this all means for the GCC. Certainly GCC will pursue progressive pro-business policies in the coming years. It's not moving away from that. Um, the UAE has led the way uh, in developing and implementing progressive pro-business, pro-investment, which has helped create a dynamic business sector with foreign participation. This is not going to change. This is actually going to get even better. It is not standing still and will push for various initiatives to maintain 
and enhances attractiveness as a leading trade and investment destination. And as you can see from uh, the chart there, major recent development and plans include citizenship laws and visa reform, uh, stronger rights of settlement for foreigners, quite unheard of, change to the working week aligning with other major economies, 4.5 days, Monday to Friday. You may think, why is this? This is not so important. Very much important. They want to move with the rest of the world. FDI degree permitting 100% foreign ownership of onshore companies. Widespread legislative reform 2021 to develop a stronger legislative structure in various sectors, investment, trade, and industry to maintain and grow its competitive edge. Keep a close eye on all the regulations in these six key uh, boxes that are unfolding in the coming years. Very much an evolving business relationships taking place. So what is a relationship between the UAE and South Korea? Both the countries are celebrating the 40th anniversary of their diplomatic ties which were launched in 1980, inauguration of the South Korean embassy in Abu Dhabi. There's no question the partnership between the two countries has included the launch of a number of relationships and visits and meetings between the senior officials. Ties between the two countries have significantly advanced, reaching the level of a strategic partnership in 2009 and elevated to a strategic, special strategic partnership in 2018. So what are the, some of the key commercial milestones, I would say, was the signing of the Barak nuclear power plant construction project. This is going all the way back to 2009, which is $18.6 billion. So long history, UAE and South Korea have cooperated in the field of small, medium-sized enterprises, and exchange expertise in this area. Unsurprising given dynamic and successful SME environment in South Korea as well. So very much like-minded policies and visions. Joint economic committee meetings have helped to reinforce relations, strengthen corporations in the areas of innovation, technologies, SMEs, medicine, education, and healthcare. These are just some of the areas. UAE Cultural, Korea Cultural Dialogue Initiative of 2020 was launched to highlight a model of international relations based on respect and tolerance. Very important. So key energy and non-energy trade partner. The two charts show um, South Korea, imports from the GCC, States or GCC export to ROK and ROK exports to GCC states or GCC imports from the country sourced here. UAE accounts for over 40% of Korean goods exports to the GCC and around 15% of Korean goods imports from the GCC. So in 2020, for instance, ROK imported 6 billion of goods from UAE and exported around 4 billion of goods to UAE. So between them, the bilateral trade is in the region of nine to ten billion dollar. UAE is a major supply of energy products to Korea and leading buyer of Korean goods among Arab states. Value high value content that is valued upper end. Strong bilateral trade and investment relations in the energy sector. I've seen also seen some major deals taking place in region, recent years. For instance, Abu Dhabi National Oil Company, ADNOC signed a three-year framework agreements with South Korean energy companies to explore upstream exploration and production opportunities, potential downstream investments, and bunkering opportunities for both crude oil and liquefied natural gas LNG in 2019. So you can see where this is going ad hoc in mid-2021, for instance, also provided financial support for South Korean companies with overseas contracts in the Middle East. UAE is the leading importer of Korean goods in the GCC, a very important fact, some of which are re-exported regionally and internationally. UAE bucked the trend and raised its level of goods imports from South Korea in 2020. 
So bilateral goods trade, which is oil, non-oil, amounted to almost 9.4 billion in 2020. While in the first half of this year, non-oil trade grew to 2.2 billion. So bottom line, bilateral trade flows will rise in the years ahead. Why? Aligned economic development strategy, comprehensive economic partnership agreement, comprehensive economic partnership agreement, including negotiations have already started. Um, senior officials met in September, and both countries have ambitious plans to set up time framework agreement by the end of 2022. So very important dates to look out for. CEPA will possibly include deals to develop green technology, renewable en energy, biotech, agri-tech, consumer goods, food supplies, aerospace, telecoms, and IT. List is long again, once again. So relations between UAE and South Korea will remain extremely on a strong footing in the coming years. So what does this map tell you, creating to Asia and an entrenched trend? This map highlights the shift in global economic power from west to east over the past two decades. And there's no question about it. The trend appears to be entrenched. China and other East Asian countries have a strong foothold in the Middle East, and specifically the GCC. This is likely to grow stronger in the years ahead, mutual benefits, creating some pressure in terms of geopolitics of East and West, both compete for energy security and access to markets. But we do not expect this to be a major fallout. But it's clear where the, you can see from the map the two maps of 2000 and 2020, within a space of two decades, how business and trade flows have changed. On the political front, this is one of the most stable countries in the region. Um, a smooth transition and that succession by the current effective leader will result in continuity of domestic and foreign policy through to 2026 and beyond. The authorities will place an emphasis on maintaining internal stability by providing generous supports to nationals, including access to public sector jobs in parallel with enacting policies to boost the hiring of citizens in the growing private sector. We do not expect any major political social upheaval to take place even in the transition or a succession from one leader to the other. EIU expects the UAE to remain politically stable. It is a very well-established and generous social contract between the government and the UAE nationals. Domestic political dissent, any kind of social instability is considered to be negligible for the UAE. In a case of any upheaval, they will crack, also crack down on any instances of public dissent, including criticism of the government, its foreign allies, or the ruling family. However, such dissent is likely to remain very negligible. We do not expect any kind of major political fallouts to take place. Nevertheless, lack of political dissent gives the government more scope in setting policy. And we saw that during the pandemic and also as demonstrated by the UAE's normalization of ties with Israel in the middle of last year, the restoration of diplomatic relations with Qatar early this year, and the liberalization of citizenship requirements. Very much um, an eye on what is good for the business and overall conditions of the country. What is UAE's role in the Middle East on the political front? It plays a major pivotal role. It's a player, a strong player in the Middle East. It's proactive foreign policy outreach and deaf responses to regional and global changes have seen it punch above his weight and has emerged as an important geopolitical player. You can see that over the years, read the signs and lead the way in pushing for 
normalization of bilateral ties with Israel in 2020 and to boycott in Qatar in 2021. And he's already boosting bilateral trade and investment links between the two countries. Well, it's very much wary of Iran, though, the working behind the scenes to improve relations um, in the interest of regional stability. And the US Biden administration has also reached out to UAE with regard to the revival of the JCPOA for Iran. UAE has congratulated Ibrahim Raisi after his victory in the recent Iranian power presidential election. It remains concern, nevertheless, it remains concern about the, US, the Iran's regional ambitions and the threat that they pose to its commercial interests, particularly commercial shipping in the Gulf Wars. UAE will seek to maintain stable diplomatic relations with Iran into next year and protect its commercial interests in the region with a more nuanced position. UAE has the potential to become an important bridge between the Gulf Arab with Israel and Iran. Time will tell if it's successful in this area. Flexing its political muscles beyond the Middle East, it also includes attempts to act as a peacekeeper, peacemaker between India and Pakistan with an eye on commercial rewards. So very much looking east, west, and also south. Looking at what are the emerging business opportunities? And as the title says there, DOTEL with key strategic development plans. So basically aligning, and I put there Saudi Vision 2030 against Abu Dhabi Economic 2030 and devised plans for strategic plan for 2030. Very similar, aligning trade investment strategies, this GCC development plans, these are going to be absolutely crucial. Each state has set out its vision of the future and where they hope to evolve. Diversification in both the cases are away from hydrocarbons while protecting existing pillars will be fundamental. So it is not a question of no more hydrocarbons, only non-hydrocarbons, less of hydrocarbons and a lot more activity on the non hydrocarbons in both the key area countries. Building dynamic, entrepreneurial, competitive and innovative private sectors are key. Both the countries have a strong focus on this with massive potential for job creation. Particularly Saudi Arabia is sitting on a very large percentage of its youth is the young population of the demographics. State-backed projects, programs are being implemented and under development to drive the private sector, including very much a stronger, more diversified foreign trade and investment. West is no longer just considered to be the best. Policies are being developed fast as members compete with each other and have been accelerated by the efforts of 2020, effects of the 2020, sorry, pandemic, energy market crisis as well very much mindful of what took place last year into this year. GCC giants of Saudi Arabia and UAE, like I've said, is identified industries, sectors as most promising for development for the next two decades. It is not just one or two projects, there are hundreds of projects across the, both the countries and the region. There is top of the list is construction. And it looks set for takeoff. Uh, construction industry has already passed through a very difficult patch last year and this year, and looks set for a turning point given massive infrastructure and development plans taking place. It'd be very much targeted as well, covering real estate, infrastructure, industry, power, water, oil and gas. There is little doubt that UAE and Saudi sit at the forefront of the construction sector for the region, 
with substantial new awards anticipated and linked to economic social development plans and diversification. What does this mean for investors? Creates new trade investment opportunities for nationals and overseas contractors, engineers, manufacturers, plant, machinery, and building suppliers. Here, I would very much say South Korea has a strong foothold in the sector, especially in UAE, and they will look to build from there through high-tech offering and mutual commercial benefit. This does not mean that the Saudi market is not open for lucrative large relationships. It would be a very similar picture unfolding in Saudi Arabia. On the other sectors, a uh, key sector, the car industry, automotive. Very uh, GCC car sector suffered this major setback in 2020, like the rest of the world, and has struggled to gain momentum for much of this year. Passenger car and commercial car vehicle registration contracted. And certainly improving economic conditions on the back of that should support more, much stronger demand especially from 2023, 24 onwards. Next year is still going to be quite, have to be approached cautiously as it's going to be pandemic year three. GCC states will continue to rely on heavily on imported cars, um, parts, accessories, especially from Asia. Although they're keen to expand domestic capacity so having operations can be an Asia car manufacturer, German, European, and American, but nevertheless, they want to expand domestic capacity. Asian car makers already dominate the GCC markets of UAE and South Korea. For instance, UAE market shares are Toyota at 30%, Nissan 20%, uh, Lexus 2.4, very small there. Mitsubishi 10%. So you can see that it's a growing business. While in Sa Saudi Arabia, market shares are Toyota 29%, Hyundai, along with subsidiaries from Kia, 24%. So you can see that this is a big market just taking off. New automotive technologies will feature high up on development plans which align well with environmental and sustainability agendas of both the countries, particularly Saudi Arabia's with the climate impact changes target to 2050 and 2060. Dubai plans to have 42,000, for instance, cars, electric cars, um, and around 270,000 green vehicles on its road by 2030. 2030 is just around the corner, by the way, with the associated infrastructure Electric cars, vehicles have taken hold in Saudi Arabia. And that's where the potential is also big to expand rapidly, identify as an area to help cut GHG emissions as well. So a big market, untapped, just taking off. Also, on the back of that, digital technology and transformation is unfolding. Uh, very much a tech digital revolution is underway in the GCC with the UAE and Saudi Arabia leading the charge. Leveraging new technologies are very much core cool parts of the economic plans. Ambitious plan to become global leading digital economies. What does it mean? It'll serve both the national, regional and international markets. It implies massive investment in sustainable smart cities and districts, 5G infrastructure and digital products and services. On the back of that, significant programs to encourage entrepreneurship and innovation with a focus on ecosystems. Digital transformation on the public sector as well is taking place, particularly government services, energy, transport, logistic, financial service, and, ma and manufacturing high on the agenda. E-commerce growth potential stems from strong business and consumer demand. There is excellent internet access and supportive policy in both the countries and across the GCC. Saudi Arabia's e-commerce for instance accounted for about 2% of total retail sales in 2020. This is expected to increase to 4% in 2025, 26, and rising to almost $3 billion 
and above $6 billion in 2026. It already hit $2.6 billion in 2020. UAE commerce account for about 5% of retail, total retail sales in 2020. This is also expected to increase to 8% in 2025, 26, and rising to about 3.4 billion and this in 2020 and above 7 billion in 2026. So a huge potential market in this area as well taking place. Thirdly, manufacturing and IV industrial revolution is taking place. Very much manufacturing a major pillar behind the GCC's push for economic diversification and away from the dominant hydrocarbon sectors. Enormous investment is taking place to build industrial infrastructure supported by logistics and supply chain, special economic zones, industrial zone. And on the back of the smart cities is the economic cities, very much being built to attract national and foreign firms to high priority sectors like financial incentives are being offered. And uh, this is very, very key in terms of what is on the table. Advanced infrastructure, simplified procedures, easy to do business on the ground and supported by packages for small and medium companies. Enormous investment will be taking place to unlock potential associated for, for IR strategies. So what are the four IRs? Addictive, additive manufacturing, 3D printing, construction, intelligent grids and supply chains, advanced defense sector. So those are three of the big slots of strategies. Also, doesn't mean energy will no longer be a key factor. It will remain fundamental, as the title says, hydrocarbon production, storage and distribution, both nationally, regionally and internationally. This will remain fundamental pillar for GCC economists, massive reserves and pumping as long as there is demand. And demand is for energy is not going to dry up overnight. It's gonna take decades to make that transition to cleaner energy. Major plant investment, exploration, production, storage, distribution are anticipated, particularly in Saudi Arabia, UAE and Qatar. What does it mean for South Korea? It already has a foothold in the energy sector. For instance, ADNOC contracted South Korea's SKENC to build the world's largest underground oil storage facility. Also, renewable energy solutions have a major role in the development for instance, Saudi Arabia has already committed to derive 50% of its electricity supply from renewable sources as part of its Vision 2030 target. Similarly, UAE plans to source 20% of its electricity from renewable energy by 2030 and 44% by 2050. Both countries are investing heavily in solar wind projects, uh, such as developing hydrogen as a clean energy source. Saudi Arabia is also you planning to use its Saudi Green Initiative program to facilitate green investment in the region of $190 billion by 2030. Similarly, UAE is planning to invest $163 billion in clean and renewable energy through to 2050. Massive opportunities there as well. So where does that leave the other sectors as well as part of the development? Kickstarting, I would say, this is this is the sector that's going to remain the most challenging. Kickstarting travel and tourism. This is the sector. The hospitality has been one of the worst affected sectors by the pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic globally, and GCC sector largely grounded to a halt in 2020. Major impact on hospitality, leisure sector, and development plans. National airlines grounded and then restricted service. Tentative recovery is still expected to continue to start in 2022 and could pick up in 2023 plus. UAE has received and continues to receive a major boost from the delayed Expo, Dubai Expo 2020 this year. Saudi Arabia will benefit from the resumption of Hajj and Umrah pilgrimages. Um, which has been um, restricted and actually canceled in 20, 
2020. GCC leads the way in COVID-19 vaccinations. We've seen that in the earlier slides and setting safe passage arrangements, but much will depend on mass vaccination plans abroad that facilitate light touch travel restrictions and international travel appetite. So the world has to be more or less inoculated at the same time to cut the risks of any serious impact from future COVID-19. Promoting travel and tourism remained and will remain a central long-term ambition across the three city, especially the two countries, UAE and Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is just dipping its toe into the tourism sector, while UAE is streets ahead. UAE is already looking to Asia for more tourism business, and South Korea, I would say, is very much in, is in, line, in the line of the site for that. On the healthcare, there is no question about it. This is the two areas. Health and education is very much going to receive a boost as well. Investing in human capital is a major feature of long-term visions across the GCC. UAE and Saudi governments will expand and upgrade health, education, facility services, advanced technology, cutting edge techniques will be explored to improve social outcomes, health and education. Technologies that will play a key role will include about learning, personalized medicine, robo care and connected care. Total public and private healthcare spending per person is going to stay high at around $1,500 per person in Saudi Arabia and around $2,000 in UAE right up to 2026. Finally, just to give you a quick roundup of the key takeaways from the presentation, MENA and the pandemic. There's no question about it. Governments responded quickly and positioned the GCC in a much stronger position to recover uh, from the vaccine rollout and the pandemic. No question about it. There was a synchronized downturn and economies were hard, hit hard in 2020, but recovery got underway, very much supported by stimulus policies. Pandemic induced lost output and corporate earnings regained very quickly on the back of the recovery of the economies as well in 2021. GCC recession or recovery, um, very much, I would say, no case swoosh recovery anticipated with sustainable growth rates for all the states. Bullish energy markets will help, but emergency economic support it will be given as and when needed, but also unwounded as well. Major investment outlays, lots of opportunities for both foreign investors and businesses. Reforms to make a stronger business environment will unfold as well. Evolving business relations, very much strong commercial, political relations and building cultural links across both UAE and South Korea. Smooth transition of power in UAE and policy continuity um, expected. Rising competition from Saudi Arabia, as we've been talking about. Saudi Arabia has got very strong ambitions to become the leading business hub in the coming years. UA will remain a pivotal player in MENA politics with a focus on conflict resolution and uh, smoothing out any regional tension. Emerging business opportunities, alignment within the GCC plans, a commercial strategy, major opportunities in a wide range of sectors, especially UAE and Saudi Arabia. Tech development adoption is a common theme across all development plans. Ambitions to become high-end tech countries across the sectors will be right at the top of the business list. Thank you very much for joining today's presentation. And I hope uh, it gave you a good window into what is expected for the GCC, wider region, and also business opportunities, not just for non-Korean companies, but also very strong relationships between the UAE and South Korea, already on a strong footing, but going in the right direction 
even getting stronger in the coming years. Thank you very much and goodbye.